everything that we covered with me up until Christmas was really neurophysiological in nature, looking largely at the, is the, is the all of the all of the domains of a of a of a holistic, you know, really trying to get people towards a, a whole of life approach towards their their aches and pains, which the guidelines tell us we need to be doing, and that's really what I've tried to give as the as the as the driver behind the front half of this year, using behavioural changing concepts like motivational interviewing, pain neuroscience education, to be able to try and support these changes in your in your patients for people who are coming to ask for our help ties into exercise adherence look at the literature around be able to communicate things like the diversity of exercise that's that's beneficial for aches and pains and how being able to find what someone enjoys to be able to help them stick with it being able to normalize that we can have flare-ups people who have persistent pain seem to have a dysfunctional internal descending modulation system pain pain system and that's something that we have to be able to communicate and get across if we are to get people to follow for example like the world health organization's guidelines around physical activity because if it's not normalized if it's not explained that we can have soreness that our nervous system is like an alarm it can be dialed up it can be dialed down but generally our body is physically very resilient and that is something that we spent the large part around uh, the emphasis of the first term. All of my pain neuroscience education sessions are filmed and uploaded onto your blackboard. So, you know, if you if you don't value these things, then it's fine. Um, it can just be an academic exercise for you. But if you've wanted to try and develop and work on and, and, and implement these things, then I want you to be able to to use those as a resource. I've filmed them on on my YouTube. So again, if any of you want links to the to the ones that i use with my patients then by all means contact me and i will and i will share them with you or equally you know if anybody really wants to to have a go at, at developing these things film yourself doing pain neuroscience education and send it to me you've got boxes in the clinic um and i i, I would by all means watch and offer feedback for for anybody who who does do that <clears throat> but we finished last term with a a video, a very motive, uh, a motive vid video of a grandfather lifting his granddaughter. Some of you, uh, I forget, and I get mixed up which pods. Uh, can you guys just confirm? Is this pods one, two, and three? I, I, I lose a little bit of track of all the pods because they, they actually change regularly in terms of what I get. Um, but some of you will have or. Cheers, guys. Some of you will have got the um, the lecture with me before Christmas, but some of you would have been in clinic. So I'm going to start off by sharing that again. Um, and we're looking at it now in terms of structure of rehabilitation program because there's an emphasis. There's an emphasis this term on more load management and maybe a bit more of the fizzy or the bio part of of, of the exercises and, and there's a concept that is the whole emphasis of today that is fundamental that underpins all of that i put it into the report of findings when i deliver it and i work in any program because it's a metaphor that is integral for the sessions when we're working when we're working with grading exposure to someone's meaningful end goals from that point from that point forward okay so i'm going to share the video again because it's a it's, it's a mind map it's a compass that i want your thought process to be able to be refreshed and follow on from what i have planned today
super. Very inspiring. <clears throat> and it is inspiring because it's someone that most of us, you know, there's, there's a, I was actually, me and Paul have just released a back pain program. We were talking with the production team around the, the creation of that video because it is, it is very inspiring and a lot of money went into being able to create that. Um, and the reason it's inspiring is because it's, we can all connect to somebody that is older, that is showing that self-determination to be able to, 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 to achieve something that they can't do. Um, but bringing it back into our clinical compass now for creating rehabilitation, you know, why was, why was it, how was it possible for him to know what to get up and do in the morning? What, how did this whole thing start for this, for this, for this program or this story or this journey that we just we just watched there the goal and it's so important because who's going to come up with that goal you know that's something that you know i could i could take i could take I could take my patient into the gym and I could do a, a time Sorison's test I could do a functional movement screen I could do these things and what the research on, on, on goals tells us is that it's, it's a shared process. And ultimately, if I'm coming to you as a patient, you know, I, I'm going to tell you what I want to be able to do. But there's often a really challenging barrier that, well, you tell me, what's the first thing that when we ask people, why, what do they want from us as a clinician? What, what, what is it that makes people come to get help from? What is it that they want by coming to see you? To fix me, and generally what else will be they'll say, to get rid of the pain, you know, that is the reason I'm here. Get rid of this pain. I don't want this pain. And that is where we need to be able to validate that. We need to be able to listen to that. And we need to be able to provide optimism for that is what we would definitely want to be able to, to be able to achieve. But there is a, there is a component of being real and being open with the fact that that's not possible for everybody. But what is possible for everybody, almost without exception, is being able to get to doing the things that are important to you. And the research around goal setting suggests that, that when we do delve into this, that's actually what people are seeking out help for because they can't do the things that is really important to them. So the key question, you know, when, when this pain is not stopping you or when this pain isn't the main driver, you know, what is it that you want to be able to do? We want to be able to get that lifting my granddaughter to put the star on the tree from our patients that is what we need because what what does that then enable us to do when we got that really clear gps about where we're going measure it and it means that we can work backwards from it you know what is our load requirements in this specific example if we're if this gentleman has come to us <clears throat> and we've got this end goal can we can we then say well what is the what is the load requirements of that end goal yeah the weight of the child you know in this instance we have got and we can say what is the load or the weight of your child and that is then what our requirements are to them we want to be able to create a little bit of a surplus because that is what this person's active daily living that's what this person's goal is all about the research around strength for back pain is is great there isn't a protective amount of strength that we need to be able to deadlift that we need to be able to squat that we need to be able to do with a a, a push-up or a sit up or any amount of strength that we can universally across the board say this is what people need to be able to do and for some of the other things in the sessions following on from this we can say that in things like patella tendinopathy we have got objective data that shows a requirement of strength on a single leg extension in, in a gym of 60 kilograms machine dependent for six reps three seconds up three seconds down we can have that for the achilles where a single leg bent calf raise where we put plates on our knees and we calf raise in a bent leg position of one and a 1.4 times body weight 
for six repetitions, three seconds up, three seconds down. These have been shown to be protective amounts of strength for some of the, the peripheral lower limb persistent pain presentations. And that's something, unfortunately, we cannot say with back pain and even with shoulder pain. I contacted Jeremy Lewis about it. Shoulder rehab is much more like back rehab. There isn't a universal amount of strength. So we have to be able to then look at what is this person required to do for their life. And that is the load that we have to then be able to prepare them for, which is ultimately what rehabilitation and and injury prevention is all about there's no bad movements i like us to be communicating with our patients there is no correct posture there's no bad movements there's ones that we probably are or aren't prepared for and that's really what this point forward which is load management i want to give you guys a bit of a a bit of a, a grounding in in how i navigate that and the research and some of the important papers that I want you to be able to do with your patients. Once we have that meaningful end goal, bending down, picking up my child, that then enables us to look at that movement path, movement, the movements within that task. So what movements are in that task example there of lifted up his granddaughter? Fire them into the box. Bending down, boom. Can my person do that or is that my first goal? The first goal is getting to bending down. What else is in there? Lifting from the floor. What else is in there? Lifting overhead. So instantly, you guys have been able to do a needs analysis of the meaningful end goal to your patient to then be able to say, well, can we do all, all of those three things? Because maybe there's one of those that is the real roadblock at the moment to where my patient is at. And that's got to be the first goal. How do I find out where, where they're at? Well, being able to then look at and adapt what, what variables do we have that we can do to an exercise or a movement now to be able to change it. These are key variables. They're going to be pretty obvious, but I want to bang them in because this is how we're going to say what we've got bending down. And, what variables can we do to change bending down? Load, exactly. So that's what you saw the variable that the old man in that video did was identified that this is the movement bending down and pressing overhead. I need to be able to do that. So I'm going to find an amount of what my daughter, the granddaughter, she's about what? four stone or something, I'm going to be able to try and find a weight of that exact movement that I'm able to do and then build up from there. He manipulated load. You saw him failing by trying to figure that out, trial and error to be able to work out what load or resistance he could to be able to get going. So load is a really important first point of, of manipulating a lot of the time your got your our job is to be able to regress the load to find a load they can tolerate so load is one what's the net what's another variable that, with a movement that we can change repetitions beautiful so being able to do 10 repetitions maybe you know, they may not be able to do that, but at the moment they can do three. Tempo, they are able to go, you know, when we're getting into the temp tendinopathy work, a lot of the time people will become sensitized to high and fast load, which means plyometric, rebound, people which, you know, running and jumping. They've become intolerant to knee flexion, which is fast plyometric knee flexion, but when you change to heavy slow resistance which is the same knee flexion but it's just done very slow three seconds down three seconds up they can tolerate it we've manipulated tempo to change that movement to change the experience through that movement here and then there's one really important one that i want to pull out from you guys before we move on intensity i think yeah i think that ties into tempo because tempo you know can be heavy slow resistance three seconds up three seconds down and to change that to one second down and one second up, you know, that would be changing intensity. Um, 
So I think that wraps up into that. But if you can't current, so you've identified a key one before, which was bending down. What if someone can't bend all the way down at the moment? What can we change? Range of movement, okay? And that is going to be often, those variables we've just talked about there would be looking at the movements that are in the end goal and then saying, well, how do I regress? How do I play with those variables to be able to find an entry, find a starting point? So your starting point may be something that you're very comfortable with regarding a cookbook. So it could be that you are comfortable to start them in a bird dog. And be able to play with the pelvis to be able to say well this is going to be spinal flexion and extension in a much lower load activity can they tolerate that then is there is there ways that we can incrementally increase the load to and challenge all the way up to well that's what our meaningful end goal end goal is um it's given us a clear gps for where for where we're going but that's one of the most challenging parts is, is, is getting a starting point. And that, that's helpful when we've got that GPS. I've just got on screen here um, a article from Ben Cormack, who was one of my uh, early mentors. He's a great person for ongoing clinical education. And this is his article around exercise prescription for pain and for for strength and conditioning because they are different and i've uploaded this onto blackboard for you guys to be able to to look at but this is a very vague um overrun of of variables for for programming progression from an s and c perspective strength and conditioning endurance type exercise would be 12 plus two, 12 plus reps, two to three sets. Some of you banged into the box there, you know, reps and sets. These are things that we can change. Hypertrophy, which is where we build muscle mass, six to 12 rep range, three to six sets. Strength, six reps or less, two to six sets. And power, which is intensity of some of you, um, um, bang that in as well one to two reps three to five sets so being able to find an entry point through manipulation of variables that might include right this person needs to be able to bend down this person needs to be able to to lift something up so i'm going to reduce the load i'm going to change the level of the activity to so you a regression of the movement or change the range of movement change the tempo we change and find some starting point think about that grandfather video there for how he did it he just identified the movement strength and power martin is you know strength is a fundamental component of power so power is the ability to produce strength in a much shorter period of time so strength might be a squat which would be six reps obviously a squat could be done in any of those rep ranges but to then change that squat into producing and using strength with that squat squat would be to be able to turn it into a jump squat with the barbell or an olympic lift which you would only do one or two times because it would inquire, require that all out maximum effort to produce force very quickly okay that's the that's the difference between between strength and power you need strength for power um and this is a useful roadmap for being able to say, right, this is where the person needs to be able to go, and this is where the person is at. Change the variables, find what they're able to do, a bit like that video where he, the elderly gentleman, just looked at the movement, he found, he changed load, and then he just did that movement, grading the exposure until he was able to do his end, end goal. Okay, I don't think that we need to be personal trainers or strength and conditioning experts to be able to, to be able to do good goal setting with our patients and then look at that task and then break that task down if we can get them on board that our body will be able to adapt in different ways for different people because this is um, this is going on to onto your blackboard for you to be able to check out but there's one really important thing that i think that video is missing when it 
comes to truly representing what rehab is. I think it shows that the goal setting process is fundamental for motivation and being inspired to actually act. I think it shows really, really beautifully graded exposure, regression to find the level that you're at and then increase until you're able to do the important thing. What I don't think it shows is pain. And when someone comes and they have been told by another healthcare professional that they are 65 and they have degeneration in their spine, and then they've even got an MRI scan that shows it. I don't think it shows that, that we asked this gentleman around, you know, we're saying this goal is to lift your granddaughter on top of the tree. And he's saying, no, but I don't, I don't know if I'm lifting the right way. We don't know if he's been told he's been on a manual handling course and they tell you you've got to be able to lift with a straight spine. You know, we don't know these beliefs that people have that will often be one of the biggest barriers to them being able to do that process that we just saw in that video. And you guys have, what, what is the mnemonic that you guys have to be able to collect that I've taken you through to be able to collect those beliefs? Here's a memory test. This is the one, this is the most important thing on my new, new client assessment form. I'll bang it in because maybe some of you weren't in the session, but our A, B, C, D, E, F, W, which is the beliefs around someone's understanding their, their pain literacy as to what is causing their pain and what they're currently doing about it. Because then what is, once we've got those, Bronwyn, once we've got those, what does that then enable us to be able to do? It enables us to be able to gauge someone's levels of misconceptions. If there's things, you know, if I'm getting from, what do you think is the cause of your back pain? And he's saying, you know, I'm, I'm 65 now. I've got degeneration. I need to be careful and protect my spine. Then, you know, if I'm going to be getting this chap to do the thing that he's saying he wants to be able to do, lift his granddaughter up, then I'm going to have to reconceptualize the fact that his body is adaptable and it's adaptable to load right the way to the day that we die so that's a belief that i would have to unravel from my a b c d e f w assessment to be able to then put that program in place that we saw the elderly gentleman go through so that's something that i think is missing from that video and if you guys go and have a look back on the history taken i did a whole session on that to help guide you through is someone just has someone just got missing bits or has someone got single grains or has someone got sandcastle or sandstone misconceptions as to whether you would even take that person on because somebody who is who is has a sandstone misconception as to the cause of their back pain that is you know that is not even not even a a grenade is going to break that sandstone <laughs> sandstone down then we won't be able to to get going and help to create the graded the graded exposure that's required for his body to adapt which it will okay so that is leads on to the concept that i'm sharing as the emphasis from today one of the most important papers for me in getting across load and it's this scott dye pathophysiology of patellofemoral pain and it's a tissue homeostasis perspective it's a very famous paper in rehabilitation circles it's from 2005 but it still holds true as a concept just as strong today as it did back then and this paper is going to be on blackboard for you to read and check it out. I highly recommend it because this is what I'm now going to go through, how we translate this to our patients and how we translate this into rehabilitation programs, being able to communicate tissue homeostasis, how that can change, how we pitch our activities, because if we can get this line here, which is our metaphorical envelope of function, then this stuff 
just outside it is what will cause a positive adaptation. If we put stuff way outside of it, we will exceed tissue tolerance to the point of frank failure. Equally, if we come really uh, way under our tissue capacity, then our body will do the opposite. It will atrophy, it will take it away. And being able to get this across for how that does change as a heuristic concept is what I'm going to now share, which is going to be from mine and Paul's self-management back pain program that, um, yeah, some great speakers coming up there that Paul's arranged. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna share the envelope of function uh, education for patients that I've cr we've created. And there's also going to be some tasks that you're going to be invited to do at the end of this. Will this be on Collaborate? Carly, is that to me or Paul? I'll let Paul take that one then. Super. Okay, so you won't have access to this video outside of this session, but this is recorded on Panopto, so this will be online. This is in our self-management back pain program, and I've also uploaded the, the workbook chapter that we've made with this for TAS, because this is something that anybody who works um, with patients for, with us, they have to be able to communicate this concept with their patient. So it's something that you will be able to decide whether you find it helpful or not at the end of it. I'm gonna play this because this is far clearer for me to be able to draw this concept as it's recorded. And I want you to make any notes as you're going through that you see necessary because then there is going to be some tasks for you at the end. this point and around this point is neurophysiological in nature. We're looking at this broad perspective that is the human experience of pain and rehabilitation has a big component of that. Now you will have also seen throughout your workbook and after this point a term called graded exposure which is grounded in the field of psychology for fear and being able to expose yourself to something that you would be frightened of like spiders is the example that we have in our in our workbook but graded exposure is going to be something that also transcends into the physical movements that we're going to be exposing you to that you might also be frightened of for previous history of of a bad experience and or you haven't done it for a period of time. Okay, and what I'm talking about here is load management. And I'm gonna draw a concept here because there's a new metaphor that we're gonna be introducing called the envelope function. Now, our bodies, my body, your body, is always tr trying to strike a balance. This balance is being struck all the time, not just in our bodies, outside of our body. An example would be the weather. If we have, if we have rain for a long period of time, then at some point that's going to balance out. Another example in my body that I like to be able to use is salt. Is it possible to have too little salt? Is it possible to have too much salt? There's a balance and that's going to maybe change over time, but that balance is what is integral. And from a load perspective, this is what our tissues are always striving to be able to balance. The amount of load or force that's going through your muscles, through your bones and through your jo joints. And I'm going to explore what that looks like for you now. And you're going to actually do this afterwards for yourself. But if I was to draw this on a graph, I could draw a load on this axis going up this way. More load going up. I could do something that is load and more often, I'm going to call it frequency. Okay, so this, 
underneath this line here is everything that you are able to do. It's the fancy word we're talking about here is homeostasis, if you cast your mind back to when you maybe did biology in school, but the other word for homeostasis is balance, and that's, what I, that's how I want us to be able to frame it. Now, I'm going to draw some hypothetical examples on here, but if we were to think of a high load activity for you, a high force, a high force, but you're able to do it. And I'm going to give an example of a squat. So maybe you are able to squat 40 kilograms. Okay, barbell squat, and you can do it for five repetitions. I'm going to draw it on here. It's a high load, but it's underneath this line, which means that we are able to do it. We'll call it 10 kilograms for five reps. Okay, so if I was to take an activity that we can do much more of as it's a lower load, we'll say walking and we'll put a distance on it that you're able to do no problem at the moment. So we could say two miles. Two mile walk, okay? It's a lower load activity and it's further along the frequency because we can do it more often. Now, if I was to give you not 10, um, not 10 kilograms, so if that was 10 kilograms for five reps, if I was to give you not 10, but give you 20, this is all hypothetical, by the way, at this point, it would sit here, just outside this line that we are calling our envelope, envelope of function, that would require us to adapt in some way, get a little bit stronger, get a little bit stronger to be able to do that. Our body's having to adapt equally if I did two not two mile walk, but a four mile walk, as is in part of our pro walking program here. Then it would be just outside the envelope, this line that would require us to adapt in some way. And ultimately, the essence of programming or the essence of being able to get fitter or stronger is to be able to be pitching things just outside our current capacity or ability to be able to do so that this line. moves out or it expands. You may have heard the idea of the envelope of functions. If you've ever watched a commentator talk about someone who's in a marathon and they're really pushing their pace and you might have heard them say pushing the envelope and that's really what this is what this is building upon and training we want to be pitching just outside our capacity so our envelope expands. But here's an important point so that was 20 if I didn't give you 20, so it was just outside your capacity, but I gave you 100, it might be so far outside your envelope of function that it would probably cause an injury, okay? So in terms of that as a load, it would be too much to do right now and would cause injury instantaneously, okay? Equally, if I didn't do a four mile walk, I said, we're going to do a marathon. It would be so far out of our envelope function that again, it would probably cause injury. Now here it might manifest in a couple of different ways. It might result in injury straight away or what we might see is another expression of it, which would be that you start training for a marathon too quickly and this builds up over a period of weeks where we are exceeded our envelope of function and then it might present as something called a repetitive strain injury where it creeps up a little bit but in essence we have exceeded our capacity to be able to adapt and that's exactly what this idea of an envelope of function is all about it's about adaptability our body adapts to exactly what we ask it to your hands if you do manual labor or if you start lifting things in the gym will adapt by laying down hard skin exactly where you ask it to. It doesn't lay it down here, it doesn't lay it down here, it lays it down exactly where you stress it. Specific adaptation to the imposed demand and that's what this is talking about. And what's really important here to be able to also illustrate is how if this line can expand, what can it also do? hopefully it becomes clear that this line also can shrink. And if we 
not use the body part for a period of time, that will hopefully make sense as to what our envelope of function has potentially done for a particular task. An example or a metaphor that I use to help understand this is to think about astronauts when they go into space, because in space, what is there nothing of? There's no gravity, which means there's no load. So if you go into space travel or if an astronaut goes into space travel for several months and then they come back, they literally have to learn to be able to walk again. Their bones, their muscles, their connective tissue, everything has adapted not to lay down hard tissue, but to you know, the body's an amazing thing. It's saying, I'm not going to waste energy keeping all of those, keeping all of those tissues. It will take it away. Use it or lose it. So what happens there is that an astronaut's envelope of function has literally come down to the point where they have to learn to be able to walk again to be able to expand their envelope of function. So as a concept, this is important to understand that it is just a metaphor and it's a model because there won't be an amount or an envelope of function. I won't be able to tell you what your envelope of function is for a particular task, but when you appreciate and understand it and you can understand that we have an envelope of function for almost anything. Another example I will use to be able to think about this would be skin or sun exposure. You know, I have white skin. I'm Welsh. It rains all the time in Wales. You know, I don't see the sun very often. So is my envelope of function for sun exposure big or small? You know, hopefully you can pick up the analogy that my envelope of function for sun exposure, if I haven't seen the sun, is going to be small. What would happen if I was to go to a tropical country tomorrow where it's going to be 30 degrees? You know, so you could probably draw my envelope of function for sun exposure down here and then be able to paint what would happen if I was to go into 30 degrees tomorrow. I would probably burn. It would be outside of my capacity to be able to adapt. But would I be able to, over time, be able to incrementally expose myself to be able to tolerate 30 degrees in the sun? Okay, so you may say that, okay, I could do sunbeds or do something. I'm not going to comment on, on sunbeds, but maybe I could go on holiday and then I could incrementally spend 10 minutes in the sun, then 15 minutes in the sun to grade the exposure to increase my tolerance to be able to tolerate that. And that's a little bit, that's how I want you to be able to be thinking of this because your goals and the movements that are important to you are also going to be somewhere out here, whether it is a marathon, whether it is to be able to get up and down from the floor. But we're going to want you to be able to draw how this might look for you because those movements are going to be important that we need to be able to grade the exposure and get going towards. In this program, we have lots of movements to be able to support you through that, but we won't be able to give you these specific movements or tasks that are important and relevant for you. We have an envelope of function for sun, ex sun exposure. We'll also have an envelope of function for everyday movements. You'll have an envelope of function for your ability to be able to simply bend down, the ability to be able to tolerate bending through the back and even to be able to lift something up. That something could be incredibly heavy. You may have seen World Strongman where they're able to lift 150, 170 kilogram stones in this fully flexed position in the bottom of a squat and then they're able to stand up. You know, do, they, do those people have more back problems than anybody else? Doesn't seem so. Is their envelope of function for being able to bend down and tolerate bending down big or small? You know, it's arguably huge. And how has it got to that point? Slowly conditioned their self to be able to tolerate that over time. We would have an envelope of function for being able to roll onto the outsides of our ankles. We would be able to, or well, most people will have had some point in their life where they may have sprained their ankle by rolling on the outside. And then what unfortunately will happen is that we will then strap that up and then we will never go there again. That means our envelope of function for tolerating it, has it expanded or shrunk? Probably shrunk, meaning that we are more likely to be able to injure it again. Can we embrace and can we engage with conditioning that 
position out of alignment. Over time, to be able to increase our capacity to be able to tolerate it if it does happen in everyday life, which it probably will. This is, this is how we understand and this is how we start to prime and build ourselves to be able to grade towards otherwise movements that otherwise look awkward or otherwise would be, you know, deviation from neutral. Being able to expose ourselves, our body is this amazing, adaptable machine that we are able to condition our joints, be able to condition our spines, but we have to be able to do it slowly over time. So the tasks that we have for you this week, over and above actually engaging in the movement practices, which are going to be exposing you to these movements and expanding your envelope of function for some common things. I want you to be able to write down and explain what happens to an astronaut's muscles and bones when they go into gravity, when they go into space where they haven't got gravity. Because if we appreciate the importance of load and being able to incrementally increase the things that we can tolerate. Okay, the second task is going to be being able to try and write down how sun exposure might be a little bit like load management. And if you can remember and watch back my example here, white, Welsh, big or small envelope of function for sun. Could I grade towards being able to tolerate the sun? See if you can connect that to some important movements for you, which is your third task to write down the movements that you maybe haven't been able to do for a period of time, to appreciate that if you haven't been doing those movements, whether it's getting up and down from the ground, whether it is lifting something up, you need to write those down and identify those to try and bring those into our movement sessions. Because then the final task is that I want you to watch this video back and try and paint the meaningful tasks for you and your envelope of function. Your goals will be on there. I've given an example of a squat here and walking. I want you to try and come up with a high load activity for yourself, which could be something in the gym. It could also be lifting up a household object. I want to be able to move a dressing table. That is a high load activity for you. Pop it on. Write down your goals, which may be outside your envelope of function, but this is going to help with engagement towards appreciating that your body does adapt we need to figure out where you're at and then slowly, incrementally increase what we can do over time. <clears throat> cool, so that is a part, an integral part of every report of findings that I would do with a patient prior to prior to engaging them in loading especially if they were fearful of loading to be able to communicate the you know the benefits of of, of and the adaptability of, of the human body so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to i'm actually going to upload this is the week three of our 12 week self-management program so that you can actually have the opportunity to Do these tasks for yourself. Anybody that works within Back to Root, as or anyone who works in any in any capacity with us, has to be able to communicate envelope of function to their patients. So this is how our infographic would express this idea that we are looking to expand the envelope of function. Once we can appreciate that injury and pain will often have shrunk our envelope of function, which means that other th things that we otherwise would say is normal can then become outside of our current capacity and can set off the alarm and give us pain. We're going to be looking at some things like in tendinopathy where you know someone will have exceeded their envelope of function over a period of time. Generally, that would come in the repetitive strain capacity and some error in someone's training. We'll look at that. But then once you're envelope of function of tolerating, load, tolerating load in the knee has shrunk just going downstairs at home becomes painful the things that were within your capacity now 
are outside. So this is a really important concept for being able to being able to show how the body shifts. Pain can be dialed up and down. Our tissue capacity can also be dialed up and down. But that's what I'm going to upload is these four tasks here, which uh, was on Blackboard already. So if you're able to follow that, and hopefully it made sense for you because you guys are all clinicians, the real challenge for you will be bringing that to life to somebody else to be able to get the important concepts across so that then, you know, this might be, well, first and foremost, being able to get across stories and little metaphors. They're sticky and they help with knowledge translation. So the astronaut example, can you get that across? Can you explain it? Sun exposure, can you come up with another an analogy that's a little bit like it? That's another, that's task two. How is that like load management? And then <clears throat> task three is to be able to identify meaningful tasks and goals for you. In the start of this lecture, we did that with this elderly gentleman and they put in a star on the top of the tree. So from what we did at the start of this session, you would be able to create an envelope of function for that gentleman and paint where that end goal is relative to his envelope of function. You know, and then being able to see what are you what is your current envelope of function? Will we work backwards, change the variables, range of movement, tempo? level of difficulty so regression progression to find where someone's at to then use those principles to guide progression including some of the strength and conditioning principles are put on from ben's article like rep ranges for endurance strength and power you know you saw the elderly gentleman he was using components of endurance and strength in terms of being able to find the loads able to to get it all the way up to the weight of the of the granddaughter the goal could equally have been to be able to get down to the ground to be able to do a, co a couch to 5k to be able to walk downstairs again to be able to do an iron man the concept is an unlimited one because it's a heuristic model but it enables if i just bring it back to this image that we've used which is this one where something that, apparently, that is apparently impossible to climb once you break it down and you make the steps logical and incremental becomes possible to climb and that's really the essence of of graded exposure so that's the final task of that would be to be able to draw that just like i did following motivational interviewing um, principles being able to draw concepts and bring it to life as you go is how um, how we keep people engaged and how we keep people following a concept so what I would offer and I've done this with the first group is that anybody who wants to to do these tasks and send it to me I would look forward to reading it and offer offer any feedback because your ability to be able to get this across is probably far more important than your, your ability to sit there and listen to me get it across. So that is um, going to be on Blackboard. And the concept that we've introduced there is envelope of function, which should then be a term there on afterwards we can use in our language, pushing the envelope nudging the envelope expanding the envelope any questions around envelope of function i will stay on the line for the next <clears throat> for the next few minutes and um just as an example, someone stayed on and, and we had a chat at the end of the last session with the first group of, of, a, of, a, of someone who they, they know a family member who has just spent a month in hospital with COVID. And now they've made it through, they've got a passing test to then be released and now they have to, um, they have to be able to try and get going again. So being able to use this idea of envelope of function for being able to expand, be able to talk about what's happened if you're bed bound for, for a month, what's going to have happened a little bit like the, the astronaut analogy here, for being able to 
give optimism and grade in getting going again. So um, by all means, if anybody wants, you, know, you won't have access to that program unless you unless you subscribe, but you will have access to this Panopto, which means you can watch my watch how I presented that again across again. Um, and of course, if it's not something that you're interested in, then completely fine. I don't think you'd be assessed on it. Um, I will look forward to any any email responses to these that you guys wish to send. Other than that, I shall see you next week. We're going to be building on. We're going to be building on from envelope of function into tendinopathy.